We revisit the top 10 China news stories from the year. The CCP or Chinese Communist Party virus originated from Wuhan, quickly sweeping across the globe. Beijing has now been covering up the true situation of the pandemic for more than a year. China's most severe flooding in decades drove millions out of their homes this summer. Food shortages followed the damage. The U.S.-China trade war prompted foreign companies to leave China. That's as the country's economy suffers. But are China's major state-run firms too big to fail? The Chinese regime takes aim at the wealth of private companies. Beijing appears to be reminding the private sector who's boss in a series of power plays. And outside China, almost all the country's southern and eastern border neighbors are immersed in border disputes, many due to China's coercive behavior. This year marked a turning point. 2020 has been an eventful year in the world's biggest communist land. China-related news spanned the CCP virus, flooding and other unusual phenomena. And it saw a new trend as the international society took a new stance towards China. Here's our summary of the top 10 stories in China news from the year. The first one is without question the CCP virus pandemic, originated officially from Wuhan, China last November. The CCP virus quickly swept the entire world and caused an enormous loss of lives and economy. The CCP virus, aka COVID-19, has reportedly caused over one and a half million deaths worldwide. However, from its first appearance in China, the information of this lethal infectious virus was covered up by the CCP regime. People doubted the numbers released by the Chinese authorities, and there are reasons why. For example, the officially released death toll from the epicenter Wuhan was around 2,500 as of March 25th. However, at the same time, Chinese media Cai Xingnet reported in a funeral home in the city, 5,000 urns arrived in two days. This was twice the official death figure from the virus in Wuhan. And this is only one of the seven funeral homes in the city. While the epicenter was experiencing a sudden and extreme lockdown, the international airlines from China continued operating. They carried people and the disease. Meanwhile, the CCP regime was silencing people's effort to spread information about the outbreak. Dr. Li Wenliang was one of the first to issue a warning online of the contagious disease, but was silenced at the beginning of the year by Chinese police for, as they called it, spreading rumors. Chinese authorities did not admit human-to-human -human transmission until 20 days later. Before the city was locked down, 5 million people left Wuhan to other parts of the country and abroad. At least in 20 countries, the first virus case was directly linked to a person arriving from Wuhan. Dr. Li was later sent to the front line of treating patients with the CCP virus. He too contracted the virus and lost his life. Three citizen journalists who sought to dig out the truth of the pandemic are still detained in China. On the top China news list, flooding takes the second place. From May to September this year, severe flooding occurred in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River and its tributaries. It mainly impacted south and central China. 27 provinces suffered under flash flooding, urban flooding and waterlogging to various extents. That is 70 percent of the total number of Chinese provinces. More than 700 rivers exceeded the alert level, resulting in the most severe flooding since 1998. It's estimated the floods affected approximately 40 million people. In August, the world's biggest dam, the Three Gorges Dam, opened all of its 11 gates to discharge water. That has never happened in history. And the discharge capacity reached almost 50,000 cubic meters per second. Chinese residents across the country told us they witnessed cases not mentioned on Chinese media, such as dead bodies floating in the water or people washed away by rushing water and dams opened by authorities to discharge water in the night without any warning. No one can tell how many people died from the floods and dam water discharge. Since the floods destroyed vast areas of farmland and crops, there are already signs indicating food shortage. Take rice as an example. China purchased around 100,000 tons from India. It marks the first time Beijing has imported rice from India in nearly 30 years. Chinese media attributed the jump in imports to other countries' low grain prices. 
Beijing has repeatedly denied the rising suspicions of a grain shortage in the country. But farmers across China tell us that severe flooding in summer and heavy rain during fall led to poor grain harvests. According to China's customs data, in the first 10 months, corn imports exceeded 7 million tons. That's almost twice the amount imported last year. China's official media initially did not report much about the floods in the first half of the month, until mid-June, when the situation received greater national attention. And China's mainstream media reports on the flood only focused on rescue efforts and the extraordinary view after heavy rain. These reports puzzled many. VOA has an article on this phenomenon entitled, Hymn of the Flood. Now we turn to the third biggest topic from China, giant corporation debt crisis. 2020 marks the third consecutive year that China's domestic corporate debt defaults exceed $15 billion. For 2020, it's mostly state-owned enterprises that for the first time failed to pay their debts. And this happened across many major sectors. Those enterprises were once believed to be too big to fall. For example, Yongchen Coal is a credit rating triple A level state owned enterprise. It announced its over $150 million debt default late November due to constraints on cash flow. It's hit banks too. In November, China's Baoshang Bank, or BSB, the largest local commercial bank in China, entered bankruptcy proceedings. That's two weeks after BSB permanently canceled its $1 billion capital debt. This made BSB the first bankrupted commercial bank in China. High-tech companies are not exempt either. Tsinghua Uni Group is a major Chinese tech company under the central regime's leadership. In mid-November, the group defaulted on its private placement debt after its extension motion was rejected. After many years of prosperity, the real estate industry is sounding the alarm too. Fuji and Fushun Group was once on the rich list, but it's now unable to pay a mere $90 million of debt. When the default was released, the group's credit rating was immediately adjusted from A plus to C. Last year, a researcher from Beijing-based think tank China Central for International Economic Exchanges predicted the situation and expressed her concern. According to the researcher, behind the huge scale of investment is a huge scale of debt. If the output from the investment is unfavorable, debt defaults will occur. If this is transmitted to the banking system, it can cause a systemic risk to the whole economy. Under the pressure of policy reform and economic downturn, this phenomenon became obvious in 2020, and the impact of the pandemic is accelerating the process. As of the end of November, a total of 10 state-owned enterprises defaulted on debts of over $7 billion, hitting a record high. Now we turn to China's practice of forced demolition, number four on our list of this year's most significant events in China. The term refers to when the regime reclaims residential land by force for other often more profitable projects, ousting residents and destroying their homes in the process. It's a practice that's plagued Chinese citizens for years. Residents are generally left with little to no compensation after their property is leveled. This year, demolition orders have been extended to middle and higher class neighborhoods in Beijing. Multiple residents have been reported in China's capital, involving thousands of homeowners. The most sensational of the cases struck in December inside Beijing's Xiangtang village. In contrast to demolitions imposed on lower class citizens, a number of homeowners in Xiangtang are descendants of family members of high-ranking Chinese Communist Party or CCP officials. Based on estimates, more than 2,500 Xiangtang residents are China's elites. Among them are performing arts celebrities, painting and calligraphy artists, journalists, professors, and more. Many of them enjoy extensive social connections and influence. But despite their status, the regime has labeled their lawfully purchased homes illegal, and they're facing teardowns. As for those questioning the forced destruction, authorities refuse to explain their reasoning. Some homeowners pledge to fight for their property rights, but all are met with brutal punishment. Political science and law professor Yang Yushen of Beijing University is one of them. He's one of China's top law professors. But his title makes little difference to authorities, who cut off his electricity and water supply to force him out of his house. That's despite the winter's freezing temperatures, around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Even elderly citizens face the same fate. One 80-year-old Chinese man whose house is slated for destruction begged authorities for mercy. He says his grandfather served China and fought during war. But authorities pay no mind to his claims of loyalty to the country. Another resident over 90 years old protested by holding a banner. His cardboard sign reads, I am 93 years old. I am bedridden. I have nowhere to go. Coming in at number five on our list, the Chinese regime's suppression of private companies. The Communist Party released a document this September to tighten its control on private entrepreneurs. It requires them to increase their political, ideological and emotional identification with the regime's values. It also insists the party controls the talents and must instill a solid determination to follow the CCP and the country's private entrepreneurs. The regime has always kept a tight hold on its private entrepreneurs, especially the most influential ones. Sun Dao is an example. He's known as the conscience of Chinese entrepreneurs and founded Hebei Province's Dao Agriculture and Animal Husbandry Group in 1985. It has since grown into one of China's 500 largest private enterprises, employing more than 9,000 staff members and reaching an annual output value of nearly $500 million. Sun is concerned about many of China's social issues and often speaks out against what he calls injustices. Sun Dao was sentenced to three years probation on charges authorities labeled illegal fundraising. But the move was widely seen as revenge from authorities for his giving social injustice a voice. In addition to agriculture, Sun's company also expanded into the healthcare field and owns a Dao hospital. The facility began attracting attention following Sun's arrest. The hospital is known for offering very affordable treatment programs and even provides free medicine boxes for those with minor illnesses to take. Some speculate Dao Hospital's unusual practices may also have led to his arrest. The environment for private companies in China is deteriorating. It's been revealed that Chinese state-owned capital is starting to enter listed private companies on a large scale. Weeks after Sun's arrest, another billionaire entrepreneur in China was arrested. This time, it's Yang Zhongyi, who previously held the title of richest man in the megacity of Nanjing. Officials accused him of illegally fundraising from the public. His company mainly manufactures thermal electric components. Jack Ma, one of the country's most celebrated entrepreneurs, has also been targeted. He's head of e-commerce giant Alibaba and co-founder of financial services firm Ant Group, which was dealt a heavy financial blow this year. The group's initial public offering, or IPO, was blocked by the authorities just before launch. It came as a warning from authorities and a reminder of the Chinese regime's authorities over the private sector. If launched, it would have become the world's largest IPO of its kind. Now for this year's sixth most important event, the U.S.-China trade war. After almost two years of ups and downs, the U.S.-China trade war finally came to a phase one agreement this January. China agreed to increase purchases of American products and services by at least $200 billion over the next two years. Even though China had not met its obligations under the deal, negotiations were halted by the CCP virus. But the trade war already imposed huge pressure on China's economy. Due to the U.S. tariffs, many companies were forced to shift parts of their supply chains out of China to other Asian countries. That's as growing amounts of capital flow out of China via Hong Kong. U.S. imports of Chinese goods have also significantly declined, ramping up China's unemployment problems. Around 60 million people in the country work in export-related industries. A 30 percent decline in China's exports could cause 18 million people to lose their jobs. A renowned economist in China denounced the regime's high unemployment rate, saying in June of this year 20 percent of Chinese people were out of work, meaning 100 million people. And the state of U.S.-China trade war is still one of the main reasons behind it. Now we turn to number seven on our list. Beijing's national security law over Hong Kong officially took effect in June. Two weeks later, U.S. President Donald Trump signed an executive order revoking Hong Kong's special status, effectively canceling the city's unique allowances in trade 
finance, and other areas. In Washington's eyes, the law transformed Hong Kong into a full-fledged Chinese city. At the same time, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act passed by the U.S. Congress aims to hold certain Chinese officials accountable namely those suspected of suppressing Hong Kong's freedom. One day after Congress passed the law, a Hong Konger was arrested for carrying a Hong Kong independence flag in his backpack. Months later in August, Hong Kong police arrested renowned Hong Kong media tycoon and social activist Jimmy Lai. He was arrested for what authorities labeled colluding with foreign forces to endanger national security. Hundreds of police officers were sent to search Lai's media group headquarters, something unprecedented in Hong Kong's history. And earlier in December, prominent pro-democracy activists Joshua Wang, Ivan Lam and Agnes Chow were sentenced to several months in prison for a so-called unapproved gathering during last year's anti-regime protests. Legal experts have raised concerns that Hong Kong's judicial independence is lost. A concerning idea, as its freedom allows the city to maintain status as an international financial hub. The UK, Germany, France, Canada, Australia and other Western countries have all criticized Beijing for limiting freedoms in Hong Kong. Now for the eighth topic, we look to China's neighbors and their border disputes with the CCP. In July, U.S. State Secretary Mike Pompeo made clear Beijing's claims to offshore resources across most of the South China Sea are completely unlawful. In a declaration, he says the world will not allow Beijing to treat the South China Sea as its maritime empire. This is the first time the U.S. has publicly stated its position on a territorial dispute in the South China Sea. As early as 2016, the Hague Tribunal announced China's extensive claims in the South China Sea have no legal basis. But Beijing simply ignores it. The bullying continues. Beijing has been building artificial islands and military bases on the South China Sea. And the tensions between China and most of its neighbors in that region escalated in recent years. This April, Beijing stepped up further and claimed to establish administration districts on the disputed Paracel Islands and the Spratly Islands. Vietnam claims the two groups of islands too, and protested against China's aggressiveness in the area. The tension in the East China Sea between China and Taiwan has risen to a new high too. The Chinese regime claims Taiwan as part of its territory, but the democratic island operates under its own elected government and has been rejecting the claim for decades. Chinese fighter jets and Navy ships are often seen close to Taiwan's territory. Globally, the communist regime has been using all means to prevent Taiwan from entering various world organizations and building up diplomatic relations with other countries. This year, the Trump administration has ramped up support for Taiwan, including with new arms sales and several senior U.S. officials visiting the island. In response, China increased its harassment, sending fighter jets to surround the island, cross the midline in the Taiwan Strait that separates the mainland and the island, and to enter Taiwan's air defense identification zone. Beijing's actions are present on land, too. This June, Indian and Chinese troops had a violent conflict in the 3,000-meter-high Himalayan border region. The conflict resulted in the deaths of more than two dozen Indian troops and an unknown number of Chinese soldiers. In response, India launched bans on Chinese apps and made-in-China products. People say it's China's tactic to salami-slice disputed territories. An open and free Indo-Pacific vision gains growing popularity with the U.S., Japan, India and Australia as its pillar. Participation from Europe and Asian countries reflect international efforts to counter Beijing's ambitions. The ninth topic for China-related news is Chinese telecom company Huawei. In 2020, the list of countries rejecting Huawei and their 5G network grew much longer. Huawei was the world's biggest telecom equipment supplier, serving 3 billion people in 170 countries. Back in 2018, Australia became the first country to reject Huawei over national security concerns. Chinese law demands its country's companies to deliver data to the government if asked. New Zealand and Japan followed suit the same year. This year, the U.S. Commerce Department restricted Huawei and its about 40 affiliates to the U.S. entity list, preventing them from using U.S. technology. And Canada's two major carriers, Bell and TELUS, banned Huawei this June. 
In the same month, Japan updated its purchase guidelines forbidding more public agencies to use manufacturers that may trigger national security concerns. The move is perceived to ban Huawei on a larger scope. This July, Huawei and another Chinese tech company, ZTE, were kept out of India's plans to roll out its 5G networks. Due to geopolitical and economic reasons, Huawei was generally accepted in Southeast Asian countries, but things changed this year. A Japanese newspaper reported that a leading Vietnamese wireless carrier, Viettel, developed its own 5G equipment and completely bypassed Huawei. Singapore has too. Huawei is losing out in Southeast Asia's most technologically developed country. As the country's two major telecommunications companies won the rights to develop two nationwide 5G networks and will be working with their European partners, Ericsson and Nokia. Telecom Italia, Italy's biggest carrier, decided in July to exclude Huawei from supplying new generation 5G services. The UK will remove Huawei from its 5G network by 2027. Germany recently made it more difficult for Huawei to do business in the country. An IT security law passed in December rules that individual components or entire companies could be banned on security grounds. But the law doesn't include a blanket ban on Chinese 5G products. 2020 has been a hard year for Confucius Institutes, and this is the 10th topic on our list. This August, the headquarters of the Confucius Institute Network in the U.S. was designated as a foreign mission of China. It recognized that the institutes were controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. As part of Beijing's multifaceted propaganda efforts, the CCP regime partially funds these language and culture exchange centers. National Association of Scholars, or NAS, had an investigative report saying that teachers from Confucius Institutes are forbidden to talk about certain sensitive topics, including the persecution of Falun Gong, Tiananmen Square protests, Tibet, Taiwan, and the CCP's legitimacy, among others. Even though the teachers are not in China, they can also get fired for talking about these topics. According to the Institute's official website at the time of the report, there are more than 500 Confucius Institutes or Confucius classrooms worldwide, including about 90 in the U.S. By this year, at least 63 institutes were closed across Europe and America.